Welcome to the third episode of the Monk's Life Story. Okay. My name is uh, Venerable Narong Chai. Now Long Ku and call me Long Pin Narong Chai. Uh, today is the 23rd, okay, Thursday, September 23rd of uh, 2021. So this session would last about one hour from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Thailand time. Okay, so wherever you are, whether you are Buddhist or non-Buddhist, uh, welcome everyone to this Zoom meeting. So we will have a chance to practice meditation together. We will listen to some, uh, some of the Dhamma talk, and then I will share with you the story of the Monk's Life Project. Yeah, get yourself ready and get yourself excited. Tonight is going to be the story about the monk's life, you know, that's for sure. But I will share with you about the difficult things that the Buddha mentioned. So hopefully we can learn something from this teaching. You can reflect on what the Buddha means. This is, this is difficult to be happening, okay? And that is difficult to be happening. And you can feel that how grateful you are, okay, to be able to um, access to the teaching of the Buddha and, you know, listen to the story of a simple life, the life of the monk. Uh, here uh, from Papa Thailand. So as you may know, Long Pi will spend the first 15, you know, uh, maximum 20 minutes uh, meditating together. So I will guide you uh, how to meditate. Okay, for those of you who are new to meditation, um, it's perfectly fine. Okay, everyone can join this session and learn meditation together. Whether you are new, you are advanced meditator, it doesn't matter. We're going to have a quiet time together for the next 15 minutes. But just to uh, get everyone started and on the same page, having uh, preparing yourself physically, make sure that you sit comfortably is very important before we can still the mind, we can, before we can bring the mind back and allow the mind to be fully still, we must make sure that the body is fully relaxed. And this is some uh, suggestion of the sitting posture. If you sit on the floor, okay, you may sit cross-legged, okay, put your palms on your lap with your back erect, okay, sit comfortably. Or you, if you sit on the chair, on the couch, on the bed, no problem. All sitting position is perfectly fine as long as you can tell yourself that I am truly comfortable of the way I sit, of where I sit, of how I sit. Okay, the way you dress also affect the way you sit as well, also affect the stillness of the mind as well. So usually when you're at home, okay, you can dress casually, relaxingly, and sit, you know, on the chair, on the sofa anywhere at your home where you feel comfortable. And then, you know, keep your mind smile. <laughs> smile from inside, okay, and smile from outside. And one of the research done in the US, they, they discovered that if you the, the corner of your mouth, okay, going down, your mental state is also going down. Oppositely, if the corner of your mouth going up, that means you smile. Whatever situation you have, okay, whether you're feeling sad, but you force your yourself to smile, make sure both corners of your mouth going up. This is affect your mental quality big time. You will feel good right away. That is why I suggest, you know, everyone to maybe put a little smile on your face, maybe turn around, smile to people right next to you <laughs> to get yourself happy, to get your body and mind relaxed. And smiling, laughing to me is one of the um, important aspects of having good meditation practice. That means we, we have a good mind, we have a survive mind, we have a relaxing mind, that's why we can smile, that's why, that's why we can laugh a little bit, right? To me, meditation and happiness is the same thing. The reason we meditate, because we want to be happy. But that definition of happiness is quite different from the term of happiness that we normally talking about, right? So usually we find happiness through the sense door, to what we see, what we hear, what we feel, what we smell, what we taste, what we touch, then we feel happy. But not many people in the world know that there is a refined form of happiness. Happiness that comes from meditation. Simply doing nothing. Close your eye, sit back and relax and let go. The key word here is relax and let go. As soon as you feel relaxed, body relaxed, mind relaxed, and then the mind let go. Then happiness, inner happiness, start happening. You will be experience something uh, quite interesting. It's another refined form of happiness that not many people know about it. So we take 
shower every day, twice a day, three times a day, four times a day to make sure that the body is clean and so we can feel fresh to do whatever we want. But again, not everyone knows how to shower the mind, right? <laughs> the mind needs to be clean. The mind needs to be showered as well, just like the body. They both are equally important. And how can we shower the mind? And this is it. We just shower the mind together through meditation practice in the last 15 minutes. So truly hope that everyone found some you know, peace inside yourself and perhaps can motivate you to find more time to meditate. As I mentioned, the topic today is about the difficult thing. The Buddha mentioned that there are many things in the world that are difficult thing to do. He mentioned to many, many, many people, many situations. So in this particular situation, the Buddha talked about five things that are difficult to be happening. The first one, as always, the existence of the Buddha himself is very difficult. If you are Buddhist, I truly you know, believe that you know that the existence from a man, ignoble man, just like all of us, and set go to be the Buddha in the future. And then he got himself enlightenment and become the awakened person, awakened to the truth of life, awakened to the nature of things. And then he, with his loving kindness and compassion, he shared with us. So many people have come to his teaching and they can transform themselves from an ignoble person, person who don't know anything about life, to become a noble person, person who understand the nature of life, that life is dukkha, and there is a cause of dukkha, and there is a way that takes us to free ourselves from dukkha. And those people understand the teaching, and they're following the Buddha path, and they got themselves enlightenment as well. So it's difficult for the Buddha to be born. And the second one is, for us to be born as a human being, that's another thing that's very difficult. And one sutra the Buddha talk about, uh, if a man die, okay, he comparing to the dust in the finger, the dust in the finger. You think of dust in the finger, comparing to the dust in the whole universe. It's uncomparable, right? The dust in the finger, these five finger, this is the number of the spirit or human being who die and can reborn as a human being again. The rest, dust in the universe, is comparing to you know, people who die as a human being that cannot come back to be born as a human being. You see how big different the dust in the finger and the dust in the universe. And another comparison sometimes he give, he mentioned that if you think of the ox, the ox has two horn, right? <laughs> the ox has two horn. Number of horn, only two in one ox, is you know, comparing to uh, a, a man who can reborn as a human being. For the whole body of the ox had many hair. We're talking about maybe millions of hair. And those compared to people who, who cannot come back to be born as a human being. You see how difficult it is to be born as a human being. Okay, so this thing may be beyond our imagination, but that's what the Buddha said. Okay, so take that information with you for now. And the third one is to have faith toward the teaching of the Buddha, to have faith toward the Dhamma of his teaching, to have faith toward the Sangha, or the good monk in the past, okay, monk who can train himself and got himself enlightenment as well. This is something uh, quite difficult to be happening to have faith. You may feel like, Lumpi, I already have faith, which is good, okay? But looking at people around you, even though they may call themselves Buddhist, but it doesn't mean that they have the same level of faith as you know many of you here if you join this Zoom meeting. And that's number three. And number four is, you know, ordination. <laughs> Among those who have faith toward the Buddha teaching, how many people you know that actually want to become a monk, wants to cut themselves ordained? This is very difficult. I have been inviting and talking to a lot of people in the past 10 years, inviting them to come and ordain. This is the land of Buddhism. This is Thailand. And I found out that it is so difficult for a man to brave enough to make decision to become a monk. Even though ordination is free, there's no cost involved. Okay, seven days is still considered difficult for a man to sign up for ordination. And I truly believe this is so true from my own experience. You can reflect on that. And the last one, the Buddha said, opportunity to listen to the Dhamma, to access to the right teaching that lead your life to be happiness, to be happy or happier. This is very rare to be happening. These are the five things that the Buddha mentioned. Okay, so you can reflect on that. So one time, Venerable Saliputta, which is the... Uh, one of the Buddha's great disciples, he is foremost in wisdom. 
the Saliputta talk to another aesthetic, which is ordained with different teacher. They talk to each other. And that aesthetic asks Saliputta that, you know, what exactly considered difficult in, in your teaching, in the Buddha teaching, in your you know, doctrine? Saliputta said, there are three things, friend, that considered difficult. In my eye, okay, as a very smart you know, monks back then, he come up with three things that considered difficult. The first one, he said, going forth. What is going forth? Going forth is ordination in English. Going forth means completely gone from home to homeless, completely gone from a man okay, to be a monk. Whatever the lay people do, the monk don't do. This is completely gone. Going forth is difficult. And I believe it's so true. And the second one, after a man, that person become a monk, what is difficult? Okay, ordination is difficult. Saliputta said, the second one is for that monk to find delight or to find happiness in his monk's life is difficult. <laughs> Why is that? Being a monk is simple. Ordination takes 15 minutes. But monk live by a lot of rules. Okay, The rules in Patimokha is about 227 precepts or rules that we have to live by. But the rule outside of Patimokha, we're talking about thousands of rules, 10,000 of rules that we have to live by those rules. That's why not many monks back then feel comfortable to live under a lot of rules. This is the second one that Saliputta mentioned. So ordination is difficult. Okay? And once you ordain, you must find yourself happiness in this simple life, the life with a lot of rules. And the third one, after you feel comfortable with two of these, the third one Saliputta said, to be able to access to the Dhamma, and put the Dhamma into practice and realize that Dhamma by yourself. This is the most difficult one in my doctrine, in my, you know, uh, in my religions, under the teaching of the Buddha. To me, what Sariputta means, ordination is difficult. I reflect on this teaching okay, many times and I realize that I believe, in my opinion, Sariputta points specifically to ordination with a clear goal, why you become a monk. The reason you're not happy as a monk because you may not have a clear goal why you become a monk. But if you do have a clear goal that the Buddha talk about suffering, talk about Tukka, whoever sign up to become a monk, they understand the teaching and they want to free themselves from those Tukka. And then they do whatever it takes to get there, to realize Nibbana, to realize the true peace. So without a clear goal, without having a clear specific goal, in ordination, it's very difficult to find peace in your ordination. And many monks get lost along the way. And later on, they quit their disrobe and go back home. And that is why Saliputta said ordination is difficult. And another occasion, okay, someone asked Saliputta, the same person, what exactly is the reason that you ordain under the teaching of the Buddha? And this is what his answer looked like. He said, friends, for the accurate and exact comprehension of what? of dukkha, okay? I, I like to stick with the word dukkha. Okay? Some people translate it to suffering, translate it to oppression, translate to unsatisfactoriness. Whatever English vocabulary that you feel makes sense to you, it's okay. But all of this together, it point to one word, which is dukkha. For accurate and exact comprehension of dukkha, I lead the holy life in the dispensation of the Buddha because I want to free myself from Dukkha. That's why I follow the Buddha teaching. And that's what he said. And friend, the path and, method and methodology for the accurate and exact comprehension of you know, free oneself from Dukkha is the noble eightfold path. And once he get to this understanding, he feel delight, he feel joy, he feel very confident to follow the Buddha teaching. And that's what the answer of Saliputta give to another friend that asked him why he ordained. And something like this, you know, I feel very touched when I study the, the teaching in the sutra. So I can reflect myself to the people in the Buddha time why they become a monk. For those of you who are interested to become a monk, I think it's very good okay, for us to have this a session like this so I can help lay down some information, give you the background of the monk's life, why people become a monk, what kind of benefit that you would get out of your ordination. And this is the retreat. We enter the 90-day retreat. And we have one more month to go. 
in this rainy season, according to the Vinaya, we're not allowed to travel. We're supposed to stay at one place, get back to our meditation practice, get back to the Dhamma practice or Dhamma, uh, Dhamma study. And this year we stay together here, about 18 of us, okay? Not all of them in this picture, but you know, about 18 of us, we stay together at this place, in this forest, in Pa Phe, in the northern part of Thailand. It's so peaceful, it's so wonderful, it's so nice, so calm, so relaxed, so fresh here. It's rain on and off every single day. So wish everyone could be here sometime, <laughs> okay? We provide the Monk's Life Project five batches. The next month, October, is the last batch of this year from October 1st to the end of October, 30 days. And uh, the program will start next week. It's already full, okay? We're talking about uh, 10 people will be coming and get themselves ordained and stay with us here in this forest, okay? And uh, learn about uh, Monk's Life. And if you look at this day, the Monk's Life Project to me, it's the, more like um, a sustainable in the peace in, in the peace development for mankind. <laughs> I don't think I over or exaggerated. This is so true because the teaching of the Buddha, if one submit oneself fully to the teaching of the Buddha, that person will have a chance to transform oneself, body, body, speech, and mind. We're talking about this physical body, speech, and the mind, mental part, plus wisdom. These four elements will be Transform will be developed every single day, the day since they want that they join the training. So at the end of 30 days, they will have a chance to cultivate a lot of good habits. They will know how to meditate. They will know how to find inner peace inside themselves. So I am so excited about it. Now, this is the last batch of this year. We don't know about next year. We cannot announce at the moment whether we will have ordination or not. But it seems like there are so many people are interested and send us email every day. And now I believe the waiting list is go all the way up to almost 1,000 people. This is something, uh, this phenomenon is quite interesting, okay? Uh, because of the COVID thing, because of the pandemic, because of a lot of things that happening in the world. And people feel like maybe ordination is one option that available that maybe I can find some inner peace, okay? And so they sign up for it. They come a long way, okay? The gentleman from many walks of life, from every corner of the world, come to Thailand and seek for ordination. I feel so grateful for that, for all of them, because I know as a Buddhist monk, I know ordination, it is difficult to be happening, especially this time of the pandemic. It's almost impossible for people to think of ordination. People would get scared. People would like to stay home. People would like to do something else. Ordination would be the very last, last, last priority in their life. But oppositely, there are many men around the world at the moment looking forward to come and ordain okay, in such a place, in this place, in the place where it's nothing much. It's just a tree, you know, it's very simple here, nothing fancy, but people looking forward to come here for some reason. And tonight I'm going to share with you the story of one monk. Okay, his name is Lumpi Michel Putta Thammo. Lumpi Michel come to us uh, in, the two, uh, in February 2020, the time that uh, COVID-19 just start, you know, spread in Thailand. <laughs> so he signed up for IDOP, International Ordination Program, and we accept them. They are, you know, we're talking about, I believe, about less than 20. And they already come to Thailand. And the program is, you know, was just about to start it. We just gave an orientation on that night, I remember. The orientation done on that night. And at the end of orientation, we have to cancel the project. This never happened. And I feel sad. I feel bad about that. I cannot provide the ordination and training. So luckily, there, there is some other option. Okay, you, We figure out and we find out that maybe we can take them to Papa, this place, and help them to ordain. So Long Pi Michel is you know, one of the monks who ordained back then, and he's still here with us. Okay? He's from New York. He was an architect. He has a good work, good life in New York, USA. And... Unbelievable, he found something in monk's life. Now he fell in love with his own monkshood. This is very simple life. He, he wake up really early, he do the chanting, meditation, help all the brother monks to do the shaw, do things and, you know, everything. Okay, very disciplined person, very kind, very humble man. So he stay until the end of the program and he choose to live himself a simple life by following the Buddha path. So he asks permission to stay alone. There is another plot of land not far from here, okay, about 30 minutes. 
where no one's there, where no electricity, just pure nature, nothing there. And Lumpi Michel loved to be there by himself. He spent rain retreat there last year by himself, 90 days, no electricity, just you know, himself and the tree, 90 days. Where, where did he get food? He had to get up early and walk to the village to get food from the village. Here. We're talking about two, three kilometers by himself every single day. Otherwise, he cannot, he wouldn't have food to eat. And with him and one dog. <laughs> so I spent a few nights with him, okay, a few months ago. And Lung Pi is one of a kind. He know why he become a monk. And he really disciplined. He really commit to his own practice. I have no doubt. I know for sure that tomorrow, 4.30, he will wake up and he will go for morning chanting by himself. He will put the ropes on. He will go arms round, and he will come back and continue meditation and learning the Dhamma by himself. Highly disciplined, having a clear goal. You know, this is very rare. So every morning he wake up and he walk. So last time we went there, we spent a few nights with him and uh, he showed us the way, you know, how to live simple life. Unbelievable person. This is the place. Okay, you see the right field, you see the nature, you hear the sound of the water, sound of the crickets, 100% nature sound. Okay, so I'm gonna share with you the, uh, the story of Lung Pi Michel through this video. So in the world out there, I wanted things. So I wanted to do this, I wanted to do that, I wanted to be here, I wanted to be there. It's things that we want and then might not be good for you, depending on what happens. If you do go there, if you don't, if you do get something or you don't get it. And this can become a roller coaster. Whereas in monk life, you become accustomed to the fact that you don't really want anything. And you're happy, you're content with what you do have, which is very little, which is minimal. A few ropes, some food for sustenance, a shelter and medicine. You have the four basic uh, requisites for a monk. And so, personally, I find that appealing. So the fact that I do live in that way will help me to feel more content, feel happier, actually. For somebody who doesn't meditate, I would say it's a great experience to start to do. From my experience, I can say I meditated for the first time when I came here to Papa in my life. It was difficult actually, but I ordained shortly after and obviously I had to start meditating every day. My body was sore. I found it difficult to sit, especially my legs and my back, and I was feeling sore throughout, the, throughout some time, first two months, three months even. But with practice, daily habit, every day, it became natural became second nature. And then when it does happen, then it, it really is, it really starts becoming comfortable. And that's the physical aspect. But then the mental aspect, which I was working on, is also important. And there are a few techniques which are known in, from the scriptures, but where you are able to, to stop your mind from wandering, particularly one that I like, that I use, because my mind is very active, or was very active, and still is, maybe not so much so. So I use that technique to stop the mind from wandering. And so with those two realities, that symbiosis, then your meditation can really give you a very comfortable experience. And you can have half hour, eventually one hour, where you're just sitting and you're contemplating yourself. When you come back to the world, when you stop meditating, you notice a difference. You notice that, oh, I'm back now. You were gone for a while and it feels good. It refreshes you. And if you do this daily, the habit will be good for you. Just like, as I said in the, in the morning, also if you meditate every day, that is good for you to feel sabai, to feel comfortable, to have good karma, basically.
one of the essential duties of a monk. We should go for alms rounds. In the morning, I do the usual morning chanting and meditation. And then I have to prepare myself to walk for Pindapat for alms round, which takes half an hour from where I am to the village, because the, where I am is half an hour's walk from the village. The Pindapat, the alms round at the village takes around half an hour and that's obviously walking around the village and then I walk back to Megut, so alms round. All in all it's a one hour and a half walk. Alms around is a contact between the monks and the lay people and it's, it's mutually beneficial in a way that the monk receives food as sustenance for the day and the lay people receive blessings and also are able to uh, start their day in a very good way in, a, in terms of uh, action. It's good for them to, to start the day in, in that way because it provides them with a base to, to feel good about themselves, about uh, what they're doing, offering to others so that they can have sustenance. And then their day will be much better starting that way. And then day by day, there it's, uh, this will affect their karma, their action, because their mind will be clear, because they, they know that they start their day every day in that way. So it's very useful for them to be connected with that ritual.
Okay, that's the story of Long Pi Mitchell. Hope everyone enjoy his story. As you can see, you know, come from New York City, you know, big city, very crowded, very noisy, and now he fell in love with the simple life. To he chose to stay where he can be secluded from, from people, stay alone in the forest, where there's no electricity, there's no nice bathroom. Okay, and he get the water from the river and from the rain. And how many of us here in this Zoom meeting think that you can stay in such a place by yourself? And one time I asked him, okay, we came back late, like 11, you know, p.m. at night from somewhere, and we stopped, you know, at the main road. And he preferred to walk by himself from that main road to his place, which is about three kilometers in the middle of the night, no electricity. And I asked him, Lung Pi, Michel, don't you got scared? You just gonna go in there by yourself alone, you know, in the darkness. And he was kind of stopped thinking a little bit. And he answered to me, you know what, Lung Pi, what exactly should I scare of? <laughs> scare of ghosts? I never seen ghosts. Scare of people, bad people who come and rob me. I have nothing for them to take from me. Only a piece of rope. I have no money, no phone. So what would be the reason that should I got scared? You know, so he didn't scare of anything. He just walked by himself through the darkness and get to his place and light up the candle. All he used is the candle. This is, this is a person who looking for a peaceful life. And now I think he found it. This is his second rain retreat. He happy about last rain retreat. So this year he asked if he can stay alone by himself again. And this is it. Now he's still there by himself. So I'm, I'm happy for him. Every time I see him, I know I can feel that this person have found something in his mind. He feel relaxed. He feel ease. He feels so by. I know that when you, you know, mingle with people, you know, these people are happy. That people are not happy. You can feel that. And that's Lung Pi Mitchell. Okay. So if you have a chance to come to Thailand, to my place, Okay. I will introduce you to learn uh, to meet with Dong Hee Show and perhaps he can share with you some tips <laughs> about how to live happy as a good man. Okay. So uh, I think we have end, uh, come to the end of the session. We, uh, it seems like we have one question from Chris. Uh, Chris asked a one, uh, very interesting question. He asked that, doesn't the Buddha in simply offer a possible way rather than the one and the only way of enlightenment? And do you have to agree? with everything or you know everything that the buddha teach okay uh, this is this is a very good question thank for the question that the buddha always said Ehi pasiko. everything that he teach he never asked anybody to believe Ehi pasiko means come and see by yourself he usually end up this sentence at the end of his teaching Ehi pasiko, Ehi pasiko. come and see come and learn come and prove by yourself come and have direct experience from what I teach you, then you can believe, then you can practice, then you can share with others. If this teaching is good, it helps lessen your suffering. And that's the, the standing point of the Buddha. And that's the beauty of his teaching. Ask all the questions that you want to ask until you got yourself clear and have no doubt of his teaching. So everywhere he went, people come and ask him a lot of questions with suffering, with uh, life after death, with self, with non-self, all kinds of questions, including metaphysical questions. Okay? And in terms of uh, enlightenment, uh, I, I you know, maybe give you a little bit of, of, of background that uh, the Buddha emphasized that all of us as a human being, we are born ignorant. We don't know that we don't know. We don't know that we born with mental impurity with the mind filled with defilement, greed, hatred, and delusion. No one in the world know that. Without the existence of the Buddha, we still have no clue that we're born with it, and we're going to die with it, and we're going to reborn with it. And because of that ignorant mind, that is why it kept us in the realm of existence forever. The Buddha happened to be a man who searched for the truth of life, okay? and one truth that he found that, oh, we born with this. We have something called ignorance in our mind. We have something called defilement in our mind. And that the, those defilement is the one who run after, actually who control our behavior, the way we think, the way we talk, the way we do things. Okay? It's called unwholesome action, come from the root, uh, the root cause of unwholesome action, come from this tree, uh, impurity. And he discovered that in order for someone to achieve enlightenment, these three kind of defilement or impurity must be removed. There's no other way, must be removed. 
I don't know, maybe some other way to remove it, but the idea is this mental impurity have to be removed completely and then the mind is pure, the mind is liberated. And that's the idea. You know, after his own search, his own practice, he realized that the way to purify the mind is through meditation practice is to something called vipassana. Vipassana means to see something in a special way, to see something the way they are, to see the true nature of life, to be specific, to see how these five aggregates work. Now I see you, you see me, I am among wearing, you know, suffer rope talking about something. But in reality, you know, there is no Long Pina Long Chai, there is no Chris, there is no nobody. It's just a group of a condition, a compound thing between body and mind together, functioning according to the gamma that we created. And that's, if we can see that, the way things are like that, and that's called vipassana, and that the, the ability to see things the way they are. And the Buddha discovered that, and he called, the technical term he used is called vipassana. So after we meditate long enough, the mind still, the mind calm, the mind can relax. That means we don't have a lot of dukkha when we meditate. Okay, it's temporarily suppressed by that meditation stage. But as we practice longer and master our meditation until we go up to that level where the mind is completely still, anytime we want, the mind inside, clear, bright, all the time. And that, that quality of mind is ready for the next step of meditation practice or call vipassana level. Okay, this thing mentioned in the Buddhist text. So, and that's something he said, this is the path that lead to enlightenment is called the Eightfold Path. There may be something else, okay? I don't know, but this is what mentioned in the text, uh, and uh, he encouraged everyone to come and see Ehi Pasiko and come and prove by yourself, okay? So with that, uh, uh, thank you for everyone that you know uh, spending time joining Nongpi tonight and learn about the monk's life, learn about the teaching of the Buddha to get a little bit here and there. Okay, there will be the session like this. Okay, I try to keep, keep it once a week on every Wednesday. Wednesday. Same time, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. Thailand time. So I will send you information again to reconfirm. But again, um, until we meet again, hope everyone stay strong, stay happy, stay positive. Okay, keep on smiling, enjoy life in every moment. Feel grateful for everything we have. So stay safe. Wish everyone have a good night, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. And don't forget to practice meditation on a daily basis. And truly hope that you will find inner peace inside your mind at ease and as quickly as possible every time you sit and close your eye wherever you are. So have a good night. Rejoice in everyone's merit.